Hello, and welcome to the Psychic Source podcast presentation, Love Addiction. Our featured advisor, Luna, can be found at extension 4681. Hi, my name is Luna, and today I am going to be talking about love addiction. In this episode, I am going to cover two key concepts, love and limerence. I will first begin by breaking down the definitions of what limerence and love are, and then sort of explaining the ways in which they can and cannot coexist. And then I'll end with some personal exercises and self-reflections that you can engage in order to solve for or soothe any symptoms of love addiction that you may be experiencing or identify with after sort of listening to this episode. So I imagine that the majority of you have never heard of limerence before. Limerence isn't often discussed, especially in conversations dealing with dating and romance and sex and love and lust. But limerence is an incredibly key concept in understanding love addiction the ways that it operates in and affects our brains and neurochemistry, and then ultimately leads us to act and react in particular ways in our dating, romantic, and intimate sexual lives. So in 1979, Dorothy Tenov published a book called Love and Limerence, The Experience of Being in Love. And I'm going to sort of cite this book throughout in order to better explain these two concepts. So first, let's sort of break down what limerence is. Because when we think about love addiction, we may imagine and feel those sensations and desires that are really euphoric and elevated and heightened, similar to the way that a substance or drug can make us feel. And so what we need to do is sort of better understand the way that limerence or the feeling or state of being in love can influence us. So first, let's define limerence. Limerence is a state of mind. It is primarily a mental activity And it is first and foremost a condition of cognitive obsession. So think about whenever you have felt really madly, deeply in love. Okay, that's limerence. The mental space that you find yourself in when you are all consumed with the object of your desire, with the object of your affection. You can't stop thinking about them. You wonder what they're doing constantly. You don't feel at ease until you've heard from them. You feel a bit uncertain about if they reciprocate your feelings or not. So like, Think back to and reflect on when you have been in that space. Perhaps you're in that state now. That mental state of mind is limerence. And it can cause us to obsess over the limerent object or the object of our affection or desire. Now, limerence is initiated when there's a hint that the person we desire might reciprocate our feelings. And limerence is sustained by a combination of both hope and uncertainty. So we hope that we will be with this person. We hope that they will desire us back, but we're uncertain as to whether or not they feel this way because they don't always return our feelings and desires the way that we show them. And because they have never verbally expressed that they share the feelings as well. Although there are some small actions and messages that would indicate that it is possible. So it is that hope, that possibility that keeps us hanging on. Now what's happening in the brain when we experience a state of limerence, this obsessive love addictive state, is that there is an increase in the neurotransmitter dopamine and then there is a decrease in the neurotransmitter serotonin. What's interesting about this is that the neurotransmitter dopamine is what makes us feel euphoric. It is what makes us feel high, alive, capable, possible, 
And then serotonin, the neurochemical that is decreased, is the neurochemical that actually makes us feel satiated. It brings us a sense of calm. It decreases the state of fear. So when you are in a state of limerence, there's this combination of an increase in this euphoric chemical in your brain, okay? The same chemical that's produced when you engage in substances, when you take illicit drugs, when you drink, when you have an orgasm. It's the same neurochemical that makes us feel euphoric that is produced when you're in a limerent state, when you feel like you're madly in love. But at the same time that you're getting that euphoric hit, you are simultaneously getting a decrease in the neurochemical serotonin, which ultimately makes us feel satiated. So we have all this euphoria, and then we have nothing to kind of pump the brakes and make us feel like we're complete, or we have enough, or our fear has sort of been quelled. So the combination of these two things leave us in this mental state of obsession. We want to get our euphoric hit of dopamine from the person that we desire, but we're not getting the hit of serotonin that allows us to feel calm and satiated. So when our brain is in this state, this neurochemical state, we can feel an increase in obsession to interact with the person that we desire, to hear from them, to have our feelings and desires reciprocated. We may have involuntary daydreams, so we think of them all the time. And the thing is that like, we're not choosing to think of them. It's not always pleasant. And in fact, it can feel very persistent and it can feel really intrusive, like it's taking over your mind and it takes over your day. Remember, limerence is primarily a mental activity. And so when you're in this state of limerence, it's uncomfortable at times because of how obsessive that mental state is for you. Limerence is also coupled with moments of despair. So we get this high euphoric feeling when we hear from the object of our desire. And then we get these really intense moments of despair when we're not engaged with them when we haven't heard from them, when they don't reciprocate our feelings. And that despair is that decrease in serotonin, right? And that lack of dopamine, that lack of euphoria that we just want. And so it keeps us in this neurochemical cycle of addiction that mirrors the cycle of what our brains do when we're addicted to a drug. Now, limerence can be sustained for anywhere from three weeks to three years. And there are even some documented cases that limerence can last up to six years. And so this condition of limerence can be sort of short-lived or long-lived. Now, the only way that you get limerence to seize is either you develop feelings for another person and then the limerence transfers to a different person and it ceases with that or you get reciprocity so the person decreases the uncertainty by sharing feelings with you and often this is what the person who's experiencing limerence desires most is an act that proves that the other person reciprocates what they are feeling now this isn't merely just like a sexual desire it is about the emotional aspect. You dearly and deeply want the person to love you and to fall in love with you. Limerence is characterized by high highs and low lows. So again, it's that cycle of euphoria and despair. It's the same reason why people who have substance addiction, when they're in a state of despair, a decrease in dopamine and a decrease in serotonin, they don't feel satiated. They want to interact with the drug again because they want to get that hit and that euphoria. It's the same thing whenever you experience limerence or love addiction. Now, the difference between limerence and love is that love is an act and an action. Love is a choice. And ultimately, love is more sustainable than limerence because limerence is erratic. Limerence is contingent upon you feeling uncertain, but also hopeful. And love is something that we choose. It's not just a mental activity. It doesn't just occur in our minds and in our perception. It is based in reality and in the interaction you have with another person. It's an act. 
It is a choice, right? So there is a difference here between limerence, which is all your thoughts and obsessions and daydreams, and then love, which is choosing acts and to perform acts for the person that you love. The reason why love is different is that love is not endured. Limerence is something you just endure, like you find yourself a part of, you find yourself experiencing. And love is more than just endured. Again, it is something that we are choosing to engage in consciously. Love is a concern for another's welfare and feelings. And when we feel love, we have affection and fondness for someone. And those feelings just simply exist as feelings. They're not tied to an objective. With limerence, it is tied to an objective. We have really involved fantasies about what this person will do for us or what role they'll play in our lives or how they'll interact with us. But with love, you simply feel an affection and a fondness for another person. And if you've experienced limerence before, it is interesting because it is the feeling of being madly in love. Emphasis on <laughs> mad. And love and limerence can coexist. Limerence can lead to love. But the only way that that happens is when there is reciprocity. So the entire time before reciprocity, you're still in a state of uncertainty and you're just hoping that this person will reciprocate your feelings. So what do you do if you find yourself in a state of limerence? Well, I have some exercises and activities that I want to share with you. And the first one is just sort of an inventory and a check-in with yourself and your history. And then the other are actual practical applications that you can perform on your own to sort of quell the sensation of limerence or to have it decreased in some way. Okay, so the first exercise in understanding your own limerence or tendency toward love addiction is to do sort of an inventory of your history. So the first activity that I'm going to suggest is not an activity about soothing your limerence, but it's about better understanding your love addiction. So what you can do is make a list of all of the partners that you've had in your life that you have experienced limerence with. Now know that in order to experience limerence doesn't necessarily mean that you are dating someone. People experience limerence and fall in love with people that they just follow on the internet. Or even sometimes this can happen with celebrities in severe cases where you've never met the person, they don't even know you exist. But make a list of all of the people that you have experienced limerence with or toward in your life. Once you have that list complete, you wanna find the similarities among these people. What is their appearance? Do they look similar? Is there something similar about their physical appearance or presentation or the way that they dress or look? Is there something similar in their personality? What are the qualities of their personality or characteristics that you were drawn to? The next thing to do is confirm that uncertainty was present. So as you're thinking about these people and reflecting, figure out what felt uncertain about that connection. And then through this, you will discover what triggers a limerent reaction for you. What combination of qualities need to be present in a person to activate your love addiction. And so knowing this information first and foremost can alert you to when your love addiction may be kicked up again. It will give you insight on what to look out for so that when you encounter a person that has the right combination of these qualities, you can tell yourself in advance, okay, this is the recipe to kick up my love addiction tendencies. And I've seen it happen time and time again. This first step is just helping you build your awareness. The next suggestions that I have are practical rituals and practices that you can engage to soothe the limerence that you are experiencing. Now remember, limerence is an obsessive and overwhelming experience. It's just like an addiction. It's that same brain chemistry properties that give you cravings and that give you despair. So here's a few things you can do. One is sort of a cognitive behavioral therapeutic approach, and it is to pause 
and reframe. You can do this out loud or you can do it in a journal. But first, you want to pause and recognize, I am experiencing limerence. I'm having an inflated limerent response. And then tell yourself, this is a reaction of your brain. This is your neurochemistry. It is your brain taking control. It's not just you being a flawed individual or being helpless. This is a chemical reaction in your brain. Tell yourself, this is my addiction. This is not based in reality. If I can separate and know that my reaction is a product of my addiction, I can take steps to move through it and to move past it. So that's the first step to name it and to call it out. The next thing that you can do that can really help you is to create a list of the undesirable qualities of the person that you desire. Now, this can be kind of hard because with limerence, there is a tendency to inflate all of the good qualities and to sort of dismiss or not really give a lot of consideration to the qualities that are less desirable. But I guarantee you they are there. So take some time to create a list of all of the qualities that are undesirable in your partner. And then the next step is to create a list of what you deserve in a partner. And some things that you really may want to consider and to note is that you deserve reciprocity. You deserve for your feelings and your commitment, your care, your actions, you deserve for them to be reciprocated. Two, you deserve devotion. You deserve for the person that you are in love with and care for and desire to be devoted to you in return, to be devoted to sustaining and building a healthy relationship. You deserve recognition. Oftentimes in limerence, we're not recognized. We're not seen. You deserve recognition. You deserve for your partner to see you, care for you, show up for you, and you deserve adoration. You deserve for someone to adore you and to see all of the good in you, to reflect that to you and to help uplift you. So create that list of what you deserve. And then you may want to assess if the person that you desire is achieving any of these things for you. And in many cases, they're not. And then finally, self-soothe. So figure out what it is for you that allows you to restore a sense of peace and calm. Maybe that's a walk. Maybe it's stretching, meditating, taking a nice shower or a bath. Maybe it's a good cup of tea, a warm meal. Maybe this is also spending time with friends. Another self-soothing quality is don't just sit in your limerent state. Don't let it be so consuming that you aren't engaging with the love that is available to you. Check in with yourself. When's the last time you hung out with your friends or caught up with a friend? Is your love addiction taking over your mind in such a way that you're neglecting other aspects of your life? Call a friend, go do something fun, go do something active, get out of your house, get out of your head and get into engagement with something else. You can repeat these steps in any order at any time, but the important thing is, is that you do them, that you attempt them because ultimately with love addiction, we need to sort of rewire the neural pathways that are getting really activated in our desire for the other. I hope that this has been helpful for you. I would love to support you further on your journey and to discuss more about your own experiences with love and relationships. If you'd like to book a reading with me, again, my name is Luna. You can find me on Psychic Source at extension 4681. I sincerely hope that this has brought you some clarity and the guidance that you need, and I really look forward to talking to you further. We hope you enjoyed this Psychic Source podcast presentation. To learn more about love addiction, please contact Luna 
or any of our other gifted advisors at www.psychicsource.com.